Are you worried about whether your retirement plans are under fire? Do you know if the government's actually got your back or not? That's exactly what I'm gonna talk about on my show today with Army Robinson. Stay tuned. Hello, my fellow Ripplers. This is Chris Miles, your cash flow expert and anti-financial advisor. Welcome to our show for you, those that work so sticking hard for your money. You're now ready for your money store working harder for you right now. You want that money to work for you today where you become work optional. You work because you want to, not because you have to. You do it because you want to be able to have that life that you love with those you love. And most importantly, guys, it's not just about getting rich. It's about living a rich life because as you are blessed and prosper financially, you now have a greater capacity to bless the lives of those around you by creating that ripple effect through their lives as well. Thank you for tuning in today, guys. Appreciate you guys have been binging on these episodes, sharing, putting us in the top 1% of podcasts in the world. That is all because of you. Thank you for doing so. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our channels. We got the Money Ripples channel and the Money Ripples podcast channel. Be sure to be subscribed to both on YouTube right now. I got a special guest here today with us, Army Robinson. Now, Army, by the way, is not someone in the army, right? Armstrong is his full name. He's with Fonseca. He's actually the chief advocacy officer with Fonseca. Now you may not have heard of Fonseca, but I know that your everyday life is affected by the very work that they do on Capitol Hill. So excited to have him talk, talk to us today because what really happens behind the scenes? What are politicians really talking about? Are some of the things that you're doing with your money actually under fire right now? That's exactly what I'm talking to Army about today. So Army, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. So so give us a little bit of your background. I know you kind of were in like the legal realm for a bit. Uh, tell us more about what inspired you to take this path, you know, with Fonseca. So I spent a little over 10 years working on Capitol Hill for a variety of different members of Congress, did a lot of work in tax and financial services. And so in 2017, um, when this uh, predecessor version of this job was advertised, uh, it was an opportunity to combine two of my great loves and learn more about the holistic financial plan, which creates the kind of freedom and opportunity that you talked about in your lead. When people have, uh, we know from your work and and the independent research from Ernst & Young, when people have the holistic financial plan, and it includes investments and retirement, life insurance and annuities, they get better outcomes. Um, and that's because the the insurance products mitigate, smooth the risk, and the investments generate the returns. And so it's been a great journey. I love the work I do. I'm incredibly passionate about the people I represent, uh, such as yourself. And, uh, you know, Fonseca is inspired by this notion of delivering financial security to more people. So uh, just like the ripple effect is let's empower more people, stronger communities, more freedom, all driven through their financial security. Well, and the question is, like, who do you really work for? Are you work for, like, some big lobbyists? Like, are you work for the institutions? Are you work for the client? I mean, I'm sure that's a question you probably get asked a lot of times, right? So my salary, I'm a W-2 employee of a trade association that represents the profession. So, Chris, you're a member of Finseca. Uh, we have just uh, um, almost 10,000 members today. Uh, but our goal, you may not have heard of us yet, but our goal is to be the American Medical Association the American Bar Association of your profession. Uh, so check us out at finseca.org. Uh, our dues are very reasonable, and I aim to deliver more value to you than you ever pay into the system. Uh, that's why I get out of bed every day, and we need everybody to join with us to so that we are doing more to promote your financial security and the gov forcing the government to do likewise rather than threatening it. Yeah, now I, I can imagine, I mean, most people that are, you know, that are part of our show and the other Ripplers and followers here, they they probably have a little bit of distrust for government, especially if you're a Gen X like we are, right? I mean, like, naturally, you, you kind of question by if anybody's got your back, you know, you just got to do it yourself, you know, but I mean, how dangerous is it right now in the current landscape, right? I mean, is, I mean, are there constant talks about changing tax rules or even like 401k, like 59 and a half, do they change that? Or are they going to change like how they tax it or, you know, what's what's happening right now that you're seeing? Chris, I'm going to blow your mind. Are you aware that our federal government's fiscal, there is no fiscal sanity in our federal government? Let's say it that way. What? Are you aware of that? Uh, wait, wait, you're telling me that they don't understand money? Is that what you're saying? Oh, they understand money just fine. But like, 
you know, it's the age old, if we spent our budgets the way the federal government did, out of business and in jail. Now, it's not really an apples to apples comparison in fairness, but the amount of debt and deficits our country faces is literally staggering. And that's before, you know, people have talked for years throughout your lifetime and mine about solvency of Social Security. Yeah. Social Security goes insolvent in 2033, less than 10 years from now. If Congress does nothing, current beneficiaries will face a 20% cut to benefits. So next year's tax bill that they have to write with the expiration of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act could run 4.6 to $7 trillion. Who's going to pay for it? Right. Right. Where's the money going to come from? And that's before we ever get to fixing Social Security. So um, that's where all this stuff matters a lot. And at Finseca, we aim to represent you and we aim to help you get engaged in the game so you can be your own best advocate. Yeah, but aren't we safe? I mean, I mean, come on, Mala Harris is, is talking about how she's going to protect the middle class worker and everything, and it's only going to be the rich people that get screwed, right? I mean, is that really the case? I mean, is that is that just lip service, or are they really trying to enact laws to do that? Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, when the AMT, remember the alternative minimum tax? Yeah. You know how the taxpayers paid it the first year it was on in law? Uh -huh. 700. You know how many people <laughs> paid it in twenty seventeen? like 6 million going back to 16th amendment of the constitution was passed that allowed the constitutionally the income tax you know how they sold it chris don't worry only james pierre pop morgan will pay it don't worry you'll never pay the income tax did you pay the income tax last year i did yep so it always starts by saying they'll tax somebody else and we need i mean taxes aren't bad i want to pay all the taxes i owe and not a penny more uh, I enjoy the services my government provides, but I don't want to pay exceedingly and I don't want to pay confiscatory taxes. You know, I think the, the you've heard me say this before, maybe why I'm on this podcast, but the American system of government is designed to elect a representative body, not to elect the best amongst us. Right. And it does what it's designed to do pretty well. I spend lots of my days with members of Congress. And I can tell you they are they come from all stripes and shades and there's only five or six of the 535 members of Congress, whoever did what you do, huh. who were financial advisors of any kind. But there are two former professional MMA fighters, one Republican, one Democrat, one man and one woman. Hmm. So, you know, uh, I guess that's important too. Like we want uh, uh, diverse elected representatives, but they could be experts in Zika or healthcare or cybersecurity or the military. It's a large and complex institution, a large and complex country, um, and there's a lot of important issues facing it. Now, I know you work on both sides of the aisle, of course, you know, and, and you're not trying to delay favorites. I mean, is there a difference between them or at the heart of it? Are they all kind of wanting and doing the same things? Oh, there's, from my perspective, there's a major difference. But mm -hmm. at Finseca, we we have friends and allies and enemies on in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party. And so yeah. I get paid to win by you, whether the voters choose Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. Yeah. And I've been here since 2017. So in 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act included major threats to uh, the profession and the work we do. Do you know the original draft of that bill would have ended all deferred comp in America? They didn't, like the people who wrote it didn't intend that outcome, but what they wrote would have had that effect, yeah. right? So we're, and then in 2021, with all Democrats, we had threats and opportunities. So I don't know exactly who's going to win the election this year, but I know whether it's all Republican, all Democrat, or divided, we got work to do. And we have to explain the value of the work we do in order to protect the policy that enables it. And that was kind of my next question for you is, or what things that you kind of have to teach them, right? Like, what do you have to explain to them? And I mean, even just like, are there certain things that you're always having to re-explain. You're always having to like try to you know stand up for the profession or stand up for uh, for what's going on in the industry. But what are the kind of things you're seeing right now or or have seen? Well, uh, I mean, so that work is constant because the turnover is constant. Yeah, uh, we tend to focus 
like any other profession, Congress is defined by the worst amongst them, not the best. Same with mm-hmm. our profession, right? It's the who's under scandal, who rips somebody off. You know, Bob Nettes has cash in his freezer with the gold bars and whatever. You don't know or hear about this sort of no-name member of Congress who's just out there, Republican or Democrat, trying to solve problems. I mean, look at the fiduciary rule that President Biden rolled out last Halloween. Mm -hmm. If you went to the Council of Economic Advisors' uh, explanation and justification for that rule, they fundamentally misunderstand the role of investments and insurance, right? His whole thing was junk fees, right? And part of the way they said an annuity involved a junk fee is that uh, because there was a floor and a cap, right? Because there was a risk hedge, which is the definition of an insurance product, that's a yeah. risk hedge. You didn't get the same returns in the annuity that you would have if you bought the S&P. Mm. Well, that's a fundamental misunderstanding and an opportunity for education, right? Like they don't, the, if you want the returns, buy the S&P. If you want to mitigate your risk, buy the insurance product. But they're not designed to do the same thing, and it turns out they don't. Um, yeah. And so we have to do a ton of education. There are people up there who can't distinguish life from health from PNC, mm-hmm. right? The, you talked about some of the complexities in your show around 401ks versus Roths versus backdoors versus all these different planning techniques that are like breathing to you is like ancient Greek to some of these uh, staffers and members. And it's not because they're bad people and it's not because they're dumb and it's not because they're evil. It's because you only be an expert in so many things. Um, And so that's why, you know, people are justifiably skeptical of their government. But a lot of the advocacy work I do is education, right? All I ask when you go up to Capitol Hill is be passionate about what you do and teach them. Um, And when that light goes on and they're like, oh, wait, I can do what? How do I protect my kid? How do I save for college? How do I do this? It's like, oh, now it's all like clicking into place. Well, and that's, it kind of brings a question to mind that I didn't think of asking you, but I mean, do you really think that maybe the government's just kind of overstepping too much? I mean, that, because they have to become an expert in almost everything, it seems like, right? It could be medical community, like you said, the AMA type of stuff, you're making decisions on medical things, you're making decisions on education, you're making edu- decisions on welfare, and now you're supposed to somehow have information and know about you know, the financial services world. I mean, other than someone blatantly breaking the law, right, which obviously they should be punished, that's what the government should be there for. I mean, are they overstepping beyond just the punishment of somebody doing something illegal? Or are they doing too much right now? Well, not... Uh taking off my Fonseca hat and just putting it on the me piece, I think so, no. right? Because I don't think it's possible to write a perfect rule set. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's possible to protect everybody from every conceivable harm. That's just my view. Yeah, right? So you need a principles-based system that, as you say, uh, should throw the book heavy and hard at people who commit fraud mm-hmm. or steal, right? If you steal from yeah. clients, then I think you should pay a penalty, a very steep one. But other than that, if you're trying to do the right thing, like, and we should keep try to keep the rule sets simpler rather than more complex. That's definitely not the ethos uh, of our government, right? It is, uh, it has grown a ton and it controls more and more things. So that's just, you know, part of the reality. Yeah. Now you mentioned a lot of the tax things that are going on right now. Obviously they're trying to figure out how to pay for social security. I mean, even the national debt is, the interest is even bigger than what they can pay on, right? I mean, so it's it's getting pretty out of hand. I mean, are there is there talk on the floor or any kind of bills that you, they've heard about where they're maybe trying to tax qualified plans differently than what they're doing today? Retirement policy has generally been kept separate from tax policy, which mm-hmm. in your world probably seems artificial and arbitrary. But it is the way Congress has dealt with it over the last couple of years, which actually, from our perspective, is a good thing. Because... Yeah. In second, if in second, we believe we need more tools to empower more people to craft their own financial security uh, so that we can preserve the public sector safety net for those who really need it. And so the whole other tax fight is about how do we pay for and extend this other piece. So it's good that they, they sort of keep them separate. Uh, but even in the debate, I mean, there's a whole variety of ideas out there. Uh, if you look at the presidential debate of 2020, 
the primaries there on the Democratic side, even between then uh, candidate Kamala Harris and then candidate Joe Biden, how they went through that. Um, you know, just last year during the retirement bill hearings, uh, Ron Wyden, who's a senior senator from Oregon and chairs the Senate Finance Committee, yeah. uh, you may remember the headlines. He was all upset about Peter Thiel's Roth, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's only one Peter Thiel in the world, right? Like, there, that's not a huge public policy problem of people who are like putting their pre IPO stock into a Roth. Really? But what Senator Wyden argued was, because of Peter Thiel, look at this sensationalist story of Peter Thiel. Maybe we should cap deferral at five million bucks. Once you've deferred five million dollars, you should lose the benefits of deferral in your qualified plans. Now that policy didn't become law, but those yeah. kinds of things are debated out there, right? Should they yeah. be cap their means tested, et cetera? So it's definitely a, an area of concern uh, as we move forward. Now, you may not know the answer to this. This is the first time I've ever asked you this question. But, you know, I, I would imagine that most lawmakers, they want to protect whatever they want protected, right? You know, whatever's in their best self-interest too. I mean, are, are there any specific kind of investments that maybe it would say, you know what, we want these to be left alone because this is what we have on you. Like I know Nancy Pelosi has a lot of money in wineries. You know, she's obviously got, you know, her, her vineyard. She's got, you know, her husband's got his, his own financial profession and things like that. And it's amazing how she's all about taxing the rich, but she is rich. <laughs> Technically she's in the hundred plus million dollar range and, uh, and doesn't and but she still will attack her own self while not really trying to tax herself. Right. So do you see any kind of comments? Around? I know you said they come from all walks of life, but is there something they say, this is something that we do as politicians. And this is why this is a no touched kind of thing. If I could make every member of Congress a consumer of a holistic financial plan, it, my job be a lot easier, right? Because they do protect what protects their family. I don't think there's necessarily targeting based on that. I think it's more based on constituent interest, right? People from Kentucky like horses and bourbon. Uh, people from California like wine. Um, and, and like that represents uh, businesses and jobs and and other things. So like, you know, the Texas uh, folks like oil and gas, as do the Louisiana's, right? Like there's there's a regional element to that and in the representational nature of our government as opposed to a pure partisan one. But Alaska, San Francisco, Nashville, DC, like these are all vastly different places with different concerns and issues. You know, uh, that's part of the balancing act that Congress has to go through. Right. Now, what about life insurance? You, you mentioned, obviously you mentioned, of course, that, you know, we know that life insurance is tax free. We talk about it on the show from time to time. Uh, I mean, obviously there's gotta be people that say, Hey, why is this tax free? Shouldn't we like, especially if people are growing money here tax free, just like they would with a Roth. Shouldn't we have some limitations here too? I mean, do you kind of see that debate happening ever? Well, so, uh, I would say life insurance is taxed appropriately. Uh, and it is, and it, and the core of it is, it is insurance, right? We don't right. pay tax. It, it's in, it indemnifies a loss. That is the essence of the insurance, right? You get paid out from your health insurance. You don't pay. That's not income to you. You yeah. crash the car, you have a fire at the house, or God forbid you die. Uh, that's an indemnified loss. We don't tax that as income. And that's been true since the founding of the income tax in America. And so uh, I understand why you use the words you do. You'll understand why I use the words I do. It's taxed appropriately. Um and for sure, I mean, there was an article, uh, a law journal article written by a Northwestern uh, law student or professor, I can't remember which, uh, that was just published in the last two weeks uh, that suggested uh, curtailing the tax treatment of cash value permanent life insurance. Uh, so yeah. is it discussed? For sure it's discussed. But my issue with that is the size of a policy has to be financially underwritten. You can't just mm -hmm. buy any amount of life insurance you want. You have to right. prove the risk you're insuring against, right? Which might be the tax bill you're going to pay when you die. It might be the money necessary to transfer your business or whatever the case may be. The amount is driven by risk. And if the amount is driven by risk, then the indemnity should not be kept at any level. Right. And that, and that I guess if you look from a lawmaker standpoint too, they're thinking, since they're worried about the bills that the government's racking up right now, they're thinking, well, if somebody actually protects themselves to where we don't have to pay out so much more money to them, 
well, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe this is like, just like why a retirement plan is good because that's less, you know, trying to suck off the, the government, you know, milk, so to speak, right? And, you know, trying to suck off from, from the social security, maybe we get them to take their own responsibility to do their own things. Is that kind of what their thinking is, is, oh, this is something that actually helps us out. So we should probably protect it. Well, that's what our thinking is. And that's part of the message we try to sell. It's, it's received better in some corners than others, right? Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, Senator Elizabeth Warren have a worldview in which uh, they think that idea is nice, but they think, uh, you know, that the refrain is, Chris, you're not paying your fair share. Corporations and the wealthy are paying their fair share, right? Taxing unrealized gains, taxing capital gains of death, ta- you know, like a bunch of these ideas, the Build Back Better agenda that President Biden first introduced in his first uh, six months in office would have led in some cases to tax policy at death that could have led to 77% aggregate tax rates. Wow. That's confiscatory by any imagination, right? Yeah. Uh, And I just, you know, I I think, I think people should pay their fair share, but I think it's a trope that they don't. Um, Yeah. if you're a tax cheat, I think that we should throw the book at you. But if you're living by the rules, um, then the rules should apply equally to everybody. Right. So, so speaking of tax of the rich, right? I mean, we already have this huge estate exemption, you know, where, where right now a couple could pass on roughly about 26 plus million dollars to their heirs tax without the death tax. It may not be tax free, but at least no death tax. Well, I know that could get repealed at any time. That's been extended for so many years. But do you think that might be coming to an end where all of a sudden who's classifying as being rich, um, according to the government, could change? It could actually lower where they might say, no, not. If you're worth at least five million, you're rich. Which now I'm seeing more and more middle class people be worth into the millions of dollars. Right now, a million dollar net worth doesn't make you rich anymore. It makes if you'll get Mr. Belvedere showing up, you know, showing up at your doorstep, or Tony Danza, you know, working as your house cleaner, right? Or you don't get. I will really show at our age, Tony Danza and Mr. <laughs> Belvedere. I love it, Chris. <laughs> it's, it's true. I need television. Well, I mean, it's true because we always used to think like, if you're a millionaire, that's it. Like you're set. And now you're like, oh, I'm middle class, right? If you're a, you know, even a net worth millionaire. Uh, so my point is kind of, I mean, is there, I, this might be outside of your realm of what you do with Penseca, but I mean, is there some kind of even talk and discussion about, do we repeal that? Do we go back to the $1 million, you know, anything above that gets death tax and, and in addition to whatever other taxes might be a bill that might be hidden too. It's a huge point of conversation, Chris. So the... Tax Cuts and Jobs Act trumps tax cuts of 17. Mm-hmm. Those pieces that were on the individual side of the code basically all expire at the end of next year. So that's what's yeah. going to drive Congress to write a tax bill. So that's your marginal rates, your doubled standard exemption, your SALT cap, your estate tax exemption, which was doubled. Um, the 199 cap A small business pass-through deduction expires. Right. So those all expire at the end of next year. That's what, and full extension costs $4.6 trillion. So like in this election, you asked if there was a difference in what the parties propose. The the outside newspapers will tell you between where Kamala Harris is and Donald Trump is, there's like a $7 trillion tax window, like one way or the other. Mm-hmm. On the estate tax specifically, they in 2017, they doubled it. So- uh, it was five and a half at 11 index for inflation from 13 on. And then in uh, 2017, they doubled that number. And that's where you get to the 26 you just quoted. So yeah. if nothing else changes, it reverts back. It, go- it basically gets cut in half at the end of 2025. And so the question on this will be, depending on who the voters send to Washington for the next Congress, what does that Congress do with the estate tax exemption? To leave it at five and a half and 11, unified lifetime giving from the 2013 deal. They leave it at 11 and 22, which now indexed to 13 and 26. Uh, yeah. Do they, you know, there are some who still favor repeal, even though the estate tax has been repealed seven times since it was first enacted. Um, problem with that strategy is it always comes back. And so it's not a real good strategy to plan around. Yeah. That's, of course, they amend the Constitution. If they amend the Constitution and repeal the estate tax, you can plan around it not being a thing. Right. But that's a big one. That's hard to do. That's not like someone needs to walk in and say, oh, we're just going to change it now. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. Is there anything else that people should be aware of that you're fighting for right now that 
that could be affecting their potentially their daily lives? Uh, I think there's a ton of tax policy, not just at the federal government, but also at the state. So Chris, I'd perhaps wrap where we started, which is check us out at finseca.org. It's F-I-N-S-E-C-S-E-C-A, financial security for all, finseca.org. Um, and give us a try. Uh, but we had an issue in Nebraska. I don't even know if you heard about this, but the governor called a special session and he was worried about property taxes in Nebraska. So he wanted to lower the property tax rate. And his proposal to offset the revenue was to add a sales tax on services. One of the, in the original draft of the bill, one of the uh, 34 named services was investment advice, whatever that means. Hmm. So we're going to tax people's financial security or what they choose to try to get to get more financial security, the advice that they seek, uh, which all these people need. And ultimately, you know, the bill they signed and got into law didn't include that because of our great work in, in Nebraska. But it was similar to Kentucky did this two or three years ago. They were trying to lower their income tax and tax investment advice. You, you tax something, you get less of it. And we need more financial advice for more people in this country. So um, there's always issues popping. Uh, we talked a lot about tax today, but whether it's long-term care or, you know, independent contractor, there's all kinds of different things that affect the work you and your clients do. So uh, we're updating on it and we're advocating for it all along. So come and join us. That's awesome. Yeah, well, we should have put your link in the show notes so people can be part of it. I know I'm a member because I definitely support your guys' cause too. And and uh, for anybody that feels called to, I definitely recommend it. You know, uh, and you're right. I mean, even the capital gains, uh, that's the one thing I keep hearing over and over for the last week or so. People are like, oh no, we're going to get tax capital gains on money we didn't even made in the first place. You know, and I'm like, okay, we'll see. <laughs> like that's a hard one to get past, but you never know. Well, the, the, I mean, the idea is out there, right? They're they're yeah. fully, on. Uh, and they're the again. The allegation is, look at Jeff Bezos, right? And he's never paid tax on most of his accrued wealth because he created this amazing company, right? Yeah. But that's not true for most of those middle class people you were talking about, Chris. Right? We bought our stocks and then you know uh, have to sell them before we make any money. That's right. Exactly. Well, Army, I really appreciate your time here today. This is very informative. Uh, like I said, before we went on the air, this is like Christmas for me, just be able to talk to you and ask you these questions. So I appreciate you at least uh, be willing to entertain that with me. Absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks, Chris. You bet. Everybody, be sure to check out finseca.org. We'll put that in the show notes. Uh, if you Again, if you feel called to be able to become a member of that, to support their cause, again, we want financial security and independence for all, right? So be sure that if that's something that calls to you, check that out. But guys, remember, like there's people just like Army out there every day fighting for us, right? Creating his own ripple effect, doing the things that he knows can actually help bless not just, you know, his life, obviously, and not just financial advisors, but even the lives of everyday people just like you. So guys, be sure that when you're thinking about what you're doing in your life, what's the ripple effect you want to create for others as well? What's your legacy? Go and make it a wonderful, prosperous week. We'll see you later.